I just want to say welcome to everybody. And so we'll get started. <laughs> and I just have to say for myself, and I know that other people have had the same experience throughout the ages with the book of um, the Rech Hashem, that it's it's an absolutely amazing work. It's I don't I haven't found anything to compare other than the scripture itself that has impacted my life so greatly and really changed my perspective in a very profound way. And like great Jewish minds of his time, the Ram Chal was very much rejected and persecuted and um, an unfortunate thing is much of his work was lost. So we do, we are blessed with a lot of his work that remains. But um, he was actually forced to bury, um, to hand over his uh, a good portion of his early work, and it was actually buried. Um, so he's a very unique person, and the works that he has left us are very, very amazing and truly profound. He was uh, he, basically he was a genius, and he was spiritually close to, to Hashem, to God. So that's my little two bits on, on this book, and. The introduction you have also this work that we're reading was translated by a very uh, great rabbi in his own right, Rabbi Arya Kaplan, um, who passed away at an early age. And so the introduction that um, Arya Kaplan gives is good, but the introduction that the Ram Paul gives is um, very good as well. So we can begin the formal class in just a moment. I don't know if anybody wants to get a last minute drink or anything. I don't know if you actually have the book, but I wanted to, and I'm sure the format will change and everything as we go along and everything will work itself out. Um, I was thinking we'd just do a brief, uh, a brief overview of the introduction and then get into the text itself. I'm trying to, it's really hard to speak on some of the beginning parts of the Ram Khal's work because, and we'll get into that in his introduction, it's really hard without like spoiling the ending, so to say, that there's so much that he introduces <laughs> at the very beginning. It's it's overwhelming, but it seems so simple at the same time. So if everyone is ready to begin, we can start doing a little bit of an overview of the introduction. Um, one moment, please. Okay. Can anybody hear me? <laughs> no, it's okay. The, the questions are important. The thing about this is it's really easy for me to go on and on and on and on. I mean, I don't want to say I'm droning or anything, but really stop and ask questions as they're appropriate, and I'll try and direct them and try and address them because I have in my mind my understanding and my perspective of the Ram Khal and people, and I really, I really appreciate other people's understanding their questions and perspectives as well. This is why the rooms exist. So... It's about the Ram Khal and his work. So, um, one moment. Um, so I'll just read the beginning, the very beginning of the introduction, and I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'll skip parts of it. But he, the Ram Khal begins saying, "When one knows a number of things and understands how they are categorized and systematically interrelated, then he has a great advantage over one who has the same knowledge without such distinction." It is very much like the difference between looking at a well-arranged garden planted in rows and patterns and seeing a wild thicket or forest growing in confusion. When an individual is confronted by many details and does not know how they relate to one another or their true place in a general system, then his inquisitive intellect is given nothing more than a difficult, unsatisfying burden. He may struggle with it, but he will grow tired and weary long before he attains any gratification. Each detail will arouse curiosity, but not having access to the concept as a whole, he will remain frustrated. Um, and the really important thing here is, is we all have, um, we all have an incomplete understanding and a very limited perspective. And as a result, it's very difficult for us and our finite beings, with our own biases, with our own life experiences to approach scripture in the same way and that's the way God intended it. We all are here to contend with each other, to learn, to view different perspectives, to to, to explore different understandings. But because of this propensity for error in our own judgment and regarding ourselves and regarding others that 
we have the ability to um, really get frustrated, really overlook the important details. And it's very important, like, and I, think, I believe it's in the book of Isaiah that, you know, you know, that when you're rebuilding, when you're rebuilding and restructuring yourself in the appropriate way, that it's here, like the line upon line, measure for measure, here a little, there a little, that it's not a process that comes instantaneously overnight. It's a, it's a, it's a process that it takes time and effort, like any relationship. Um, so I'll continue here. It says, if one wishes to understand something, it's therefore very important that he be aware of other things associated as well as its place among them. Without this, one's longing for truth will be frustrated and he will be pained by unsatisfied desire. The exact opposite is true when one knows something in relation to its content. Ta- context. Since he sees it within its framework, he can go on to grasp other concepts associated with it and his success will begin pleasure and elevation. I'm sorry, elation. Um, I'm skipping ahead a little bit more to the page 23. Um, so this is talking about examining these details within context. It says, when one examines something, he should first determine whether it is a whole or a part, a general category or a detail, a cause or an effect, an object or a property. When he realizes its place in the general scheme, he can then recognize the elements needed to complete his understanding and provide a precise general picture. If it is a part, then he will seek to discover its whole. If it is a particular case, he will seek to find its general category. If it is a cause, he will seek its effect. If an effect, its cause. And this is really important because the years that I've spent looking at different debates regarding scripture, regarding different things in, in any religious community, you see a lot of people really getting bogged down in the minuscule details, and they really end up forming, I hate to say, different you know branches of their own religious per, religions based on really minuscule things. That if you take a grand scheme of things, if you do this grand overview of the belief systems and the principles and the and the guiding um, directives of scripture, then you see they're really just petty ridiculousness that is not what we're here for. And so the Ram Call and that was true in the Ram Call's day within within Judaism there were a lot of different branches and they really had a lot of animosity for each other. And that's the exact opposite of why we exist in this world. Especially those who are called and called to Torah, who are keepers of of Hashem's Torah, who worship Hashem, that that's the exact opposite of what we're here for. We're here to bring unity, not at the expense of truth, not at the expense of of um, a right relationship with God, but the point is we're here to view each other as human beings. And this is really important to look at Scripture in a, in a as a whole, not as our own little limited perspective, our own limited focus. And so he goes... Um, again, I'm going to skip ahead. Once one is aware of the general principles, he will not be at a loss to recognize the details that fall under it and cannot exist without it. This is what our sages meant when they taught us, words of Torah should always be in your hands as general principles rather than individual de- than as individual details. When dealing with general principles, however, one must be very careful to grasp their aspects and areas of validity. Even elements that initially seem superfluous should not be ignored, but should be taken to heart and put in the back of one's mind until their place in the general scheme comes clear. Our sages thus said, There is nothing in the Torah that is empty, that if, ex- that if expounded does not yield reward in this world, that with the principle remaining intact in the world to come. That is, no small or large part of any general principle will be barren of ramifications, and if to a point, sorry, and if a point will not teach and have ramifications about certain particulars, it will about others. A really important thing is nothing in Scripture is there by, by chance, by every, every, every word, every space, every aspect of the Torah is there for a reason, and that translates in our own lives. We are here for a reason. We have a purpose. Every person is unique. Every person has a job to do that only they can do. They were created with a purpose and a goal, and so understanding these principles in general allows us to relate to to Hashem, to God, in in a very important way, and to relate to fellow human beings in a much and in, in, in the way that we were intended. So. Going on, a person must therefore be very careful when dealing with general principles. He should be very precise in examining their concepts, relationships, and connections, as well as the manner in which one concept is inferred from the other, from the beginning to the end. If one does this, 
he will be successful and gain insight. So he says, taking this into consideration, I have written this small book. My intent was set forth to set forth the general principles of Jewish belief and religion, expounding them in a way that is clearly understood to provide a complete picture free of ambiguity and confusion. The roots and branches are presented according to their place in the general scheme so that each one can put, be put to heart and be grasped with the greatest possible clarity. This book provides a basis which will make it much easier for you, its readers, to attain knowledge of God through the Torah and its exposition so that all the Torah secrets will be within your grasp and which is God's blessing that he bestows upon you and so Ram Kaul will start very very broad and he narrows his perspective down and he builds on principle upon principle upon principle and so this will begin in, in part one <laughs> I don't know if you have any questions or any comments at this point you're more than welcome to post them um so I'll read just a little bit here in chapter chapter one, if you have the book, it's page thirty one. And this in this section is called the Creator. It says every Jew must believe and know that there exists a first being without beginning or end who brought all things into existence and continues to sustain them. This being is God. It is furthermore necessary to know that God's true nature cannot be understood at all by any being other than himself. The only thing that we know about him is that he is perfect in every possible way and devoid of every conceivable deficiency. These things are known by tradition from the patriarchs and prophets. With the revelation at Sinai, all Israel perceived them and gained a clear grasp of their true nature. They then taught them to their children, generation after generation, until this very day. Moshe had thus commanded them in Deuteronomy 4.9, You shall not forget the things that you saw with your eyes and you shall not you shall make them known to your children and to your children's children these concepts can also be logically verified by demonstrable proofs the veracity can be demonstrated from what we observe in nature and its phenomena through such scientific disciplines as physics and astronomy certain basic principles can be derived and on the basis of this clear evidence for these concepts deduced we will not occupy ourselves with this however but it will but will rather set forth the well-known basic principles handed down by tradition. These will present an authentic framework arranged in a comprehensive manner. It is also necessary to know that God's existence is imperative. It is absolutely impossible that he should cease to exist. It is furthermore necessary to know that God's existence does not depend on anything else at all. His, exi is, sorry, his existence is intrinsically imperative. Um, I'm going to read just a little bit further because of, I'm sorry, I'm on page right now, 33, section 1, 4. I'm actually going into 5. I'm going to read a little bit more as we get further into the book. I'll read less and, and comment more. But there's, I want to bring all these concepts because I want to touch on about four or five of them all at once. Um, it is likewise necessary to know that God is absolutely simple, having no parts to him. At the same time, all types of perfection are present in him, contained in his being, without being separate parts of it. We can try to understand this by observing that human mind has many different faculties, with each with its own area of activity. Thus, for example, memory is one domain, desire another, and imagination still another, and none of these has the facilities of these facilities impinge upon the other. Memory, for example, has its own domain as does desire, and desire does not penetrate the domain of memory, nor does memory enter that of desire. The same is true of all of man's faculties. The human mind can therefore be said to have structure and is not simple. So going back, um, the very first important belief enumerated by God in the, in the Ten Commandments is, I am the Lord of God. I am the Lord your God, meaning that you have to have faith that there is a God. This is the beginning of of everything. And so um, I'm going to step back and say just a general thing. The first time that I read through the Ram Chal, I was, um, my perspective was very different. And I, um, now looking back, and going to give you a little bit of a bias towards the point of the Ramchal's book um, that 
his whole intent, his whole purpose, the whole the whole purpose of his of this work is to bring you to a relationship with God, to bring you to uh, relate, to become an intimate partner with Hashem, the Creator of the universe. And so he's in his introduction, he's laying down the framework through which we can um, relate to our Creator. First of all, to relate to your Creator, you have to know that He exists, that there is a Creator, and that there are limits, that there is nothing outside of God in this world that exists, including ourselves. Um, he says, and it's true, you can, the existence of God is verifiable if you take a step back and look. He says, in physics and astronomy and all these other sciences, you can. And the amazing thing is, science has progressed a lot of the conclusions of physics and astrophysics and um, mathematics and um, have really held up some amazing principles that were found in um, by people studying the Torah, Maimonides, and there's a rabbi called Yosef of Akko who came up with a really amazing date for the, the time of the, the existence of the universe and all of these various things. He says it's really, you can verify them, he says, but I'm not going to get bogged down in that debate right now because that's not the purpose of his book to get bogged down in these minuscule details that become a great debate. So, um, but they are there, and God placed them. Sorry. And God placed them in, um, sorry, that was the phone. God placed them there for us to seek out if we do want to do that. But the point is, is that we know that God's existence is here because we exist. We know that there are no parts of God. God is an absolute... A unity. There is absolutely a, a perfect oneness to God. How we relate to God, we cannot fathom that absolute oneness. That it's called the Ain Self. It's the unknowable part of God that we can't. It's like the top of a building in the clouds. We know it has to exist, and it's probably there, but we can't even fathom it because we can't even wrap our minds around what exists. But fortunately for us, we have the ability to relate to God, but we can't relate to Him in His in His true being, in His true essence. That that is absolutely unknowable, uncomprehensible to us finite beings. That he's there, and the amazing thing, though, is that you have this being that exists in creation, and has made creation, and truly desires a relationship with us that we would relate to him. But that being said, there are God in His true essence is absolutely one, absolutely one. Um, and that is a really fundamental, important principle that underlies a lot of the things that the Ram Kal will bring in and introduce in later chapters. That though we see God as parts because of the way in which we exist, that God in his essence is absolutely one. There's no division whatsoever. But that being said, when you start to see some of the way that God relates to his creation, we see him as parts. He becomes merciful. He becomes a God of judgment. He becomes a God of of envy. So we have all these different aspects of God that we can perceive in this world. So to us, God may seem a fragmented being, but in truth, he's not. Um, and he uses the human mind as a very, you know, if you look at the brain, the brain is like this one. But, you know, through the sciences today that we've been able to map these different areas of the brain, you're one creature, but you have different parts of yourself even in your daily function of life, you're, you know, if you're, if you're married, you're a spouse, you're, you have parents, you're a child, you know, your brother, your sister, your mother, your father, you're not, you have different roles that you play in your own life. You're not, you're not, it would be nice to be able to have more than one of you times, but you're not. You're just one person, but you, how you function in this world depends on who you're interrelating with. Um, so I'll go on a little bit more. Again, if you have any questions, again, um, so let's see, I'm going to continue reading on page 33, and then um, still in section five. God, however, does not require a separate domain for each of these powers. In fact, He does not possess these powers, which in man are different from one another. For God, we can say, does not desire and is wise and capable. I'm sorry, let me read back. In fact, he does possess these powers which in man are different from one another. For God, we can say, does desire and is wise and capable and is, per and is perfect in every conceivable way. On the other hand, God is actually one. 
These phenomena are being present in him without being separate parts of him. They are being included in him by virtue of his perfection. All types of perfection exist in God, not as phenomena, which are separable from his absolute oneness, and it is impossible that God not possess every perfection. So, I don't want to get ahead of that. God is absolutely perfect, absolutely holy. Any imperfection exists is because the full measure of God's light doesn't reach it. Um... And so we'll go into that principle a little bit more. Admittedly, it is something far beyond the grasp of our understanding and imagination, and there hardly exists a way to express it and put it into words. Our intellect and imagination are only capable of grasping things bound by natural limitations created by God, since these are the only things that our senses can detect and convey to our minds. We are incapable of conceiving these different qualities as a single, simple essence sense among created things they are different separate concepts and it's again touching back to the idea that God is an absolute unity it's if God doesn't seem to be absolutely one it is because of our perspective our in our limitations our um, our I hate to say the sin and, and and distance from God spiritually so we begin our, okay we begin our discussion however by acknowledging that God's true nature is beyond comprehension no inference can be drawn to the Creator from what we see among created things. The nature and essence of the two are not the same at all, and it is therefore impossible to draw any parallel between them. This, however, is also among the things that we know from the tradition discussed earlier. It can also be verified from the laws and principles of nature that it is impossible that some being not exist, unbounded by the laws and limitations of nature. It must be impossible that this being cease to exist or have any deficiency. This being must further be divorced from any addition, from all addition, structure, relationship, and, compre- and comparison, or any other quality that exists in created things. Finally, this being must be the true case of everything that exists and happens. Unless all this is true, the existence and continuance of things as we know them would be utterly impossible. Um... And again, it's really hard to, to expound upon some of these concepts that the Ram call is introducing because he really gets into them later parts of the book. But one of the things that he um, brought up, that he touched on, was um, Sinai and Moshe, and that is like very. It's um, with the revelation at Sinai here on page 31. Is with the revelation at Sinai, all Israel perceived them and gained a, gained a clear grasp of their nature, and then taught them to their children and their children. It, it so it's very, very, very important that we understand the idea. Of, so there's a couple of concepts I want to introduce, even though they be a little more advanced than he's at right now. The idea of Creation is, um, let me backtrack a little bit more. Orthodox Judaism believes, and the wrong call will, will explain why later on, that that like, I'm holding a pen in my hand, you know, or a pencil or whatever, that this isn't, this only exists because God is willing it to exist at all times. That this, that this pencil exists because God is constantly refreshing this pencilness in my hand. Like the like the image on a TV screen, which is constantly flickering, being refreshed again and again and again. Creation is understood in that way. That in this world we cannot absolutely have not the ability in the natural world, in our in our natural being, using our own our our physical senses to ex, to experience the phys, the spiritual realm. And so. We have an amazing event that happened in human history, and that is the revelation at Sinai to Israel, that God came and He peeled back the um, He peeled back nature for a moment in time, and He allowed He allowed Israel to see what's behind the <laughs> behind the veil. And the analogy is like nature is to God like clothing is to our own self. 
we are, you know, we are as much our clothing as, you know, we're not. We, that's the point. Clothing hides uh, hides aspects of ourselves, and that's what nature exists in this world to hide God. It's a veil that keeps us per, from perceiving God. If you were to peel back the clothing or to peel back nature, then you get to the next level, which would be, I hate to say, comparable to the skin. That this is the this is the plumbing. This is how the that nature works, how creation exists and works and what sustains it. But your skin isn't you either. Your skin is only a shell for you to be able to exist in this world. You are truly, people are truly, in essence, spiritual beings, and the same is true about Hashem, about God. And so we have at the revelation of Mount Sinai, you know, Hashem comes down and He reveals Himself. And so Hashem doesn't have skin, God forbid, but that the the analogy is used there is that he came in his chariot, his Merkava. And so he came to Israel and he peeled back nature and, you know, he starts out with the first commandment, you know, I am Lord the God and and um there was the thunder and lightning and everyone dropped dead because the overwhelming um, nature of God's revelation to to finite beings and the Midrash says that they were revived and you know, the second commandment came out and boom, they dropped dead again and they were revived and at that point they said to Moshe, you know, maybe you should go up. But there's a really important understanding there is Israel falls back while Moses goes up to receive the commandments from Hashem and they build something, the golden calf. Um, it's in Midrash. I can look it up for you if you like. Um, I will be using the Russian in some of my sources, but I will absolutely find that for you if you remind me, Marcia. Um, and so you have, at this point, you know, Hashem saying this is a good thing. And the reason I'm bringing this up, I'll get to my point in a moment. The reason I'm bringing this up is because the way that Israel related with Hashem completely goes against the reason and existence for the world to be here, why you are here in the world. And my point is this, that you are here to become intimate with your Creator, to not focus on the external things of nature. We, it's very easy to focus on on the, the clothing and the skin and not see the true essence of God. And it's same, the same is true about when we relate to humans as well. And so the Ram Paul is saying is, you know, we have a crea- we have a God who is absolutely one in His essence, absolutely um, beyond the realm of our understanding in this world, who is not bound to the rules of our of, uh, that we are bound to. He is not ru- bound to the rules of nature. He is not bound to the rules of cause and effect that we experience in this world. That He is absolutely beyond our world, but yet He relates to us in this world, and how we relate to Him is just as important. And so. He, um, at Mount Sinai you have Israel falling into this really horrible sin of relating to the external externals of God and not to the being himself and so as a result their focus on these externals caused them to fall into something called Avodah Zara which is to worship disconnection and so, as the Ram call goes on in further chapters, you'll see the whole point of your existence is to overcome the overcome the externals of this world and to focus absolutely on the um, essence of God and who God truly is. So I'll go. I don't know if any of this is um, making sense. What you have there is Israel focuses on the externals. They create the image of this golden calf, and it's not called. It's not idol worship in the sense of, you know, they built an idol and they said this was God. They had already heard, you know, you know, don't, you know, they already knew not to create <laughs> images of God. But what happened is there at Sinai, they're focusing on the externals. They're focusing on the on nature and these attributes of God and not focusing on the essence of who God truly is. And as a result, they fell into disconnection with Hashem and they created great, they created very great, great <laughs> disconnect for all eternity well I mean for in this world so I'm going on to six and I'll try and bring my point around a bit more among the things is also necessarily to know that God must absolutely be one it is impossible that there exists more than one being whose existence is intrinsically imperative only one being can possibly exist with this necessarily perfect essence and therefore the only 
reason that all other things have the possibility of existence is that God wills them to exist. All other things, therefore, depend on him and do not have any intrinsic existence. We can therefore see that there are six basic principles involved in our understanding of God, and they are the fact that he, of his existence, his perfection, the necessity of his existence, the abs- his absolute independence, his simplicity, and his unity. As I was saying before, that the sin at Mount Sinai of Israel was to separate God into different beings. They were focused on the external part of God, and that was his judgment or his mercy. And they they basically made this being that was absolute oneness, and they focused on one aspect of him, basically causing division. There's no division in God, but you can cause that in this world, and that's what Israel did. This was, according to Midrash, that Hashem spread a chupa over the heavens, and this was their wedding. And of the one night where God, you know, where you do become, where where there is absolute intimacy and absolute re- revelation of essence. Israel made a huge error in disconnecting from God because absolute cleaving to the Creator can be a very overwhelming experience, and they pulled back at the wrong time. Um, and so, this is what I. The wrong, this is a really important principle that this oneness exists because when you do, when you separate God, when you when you focus only on certain aspects of God's interaction in this world, you create a great um, division and disunity. And I want the other one concept I wanted to um, focus on a lot is the idea that everything that exists right now is constantly being refreshed. That this pen. You know, if I drop a fork on the floor from the dinner table, it's not falling because of gravity. It's because God is constantly saying, okay, fall, 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 fall. But there are forces in creation that continually keep every aspect going. That there are channels of spiritual power that cause creation to manifest and to continually exist. Um, It's a hard concept to convey without reading a little bit further ahead. But... um, that we do that we exist in this world because God wills it not because we have he needs us but because he desires us and so um, I had to have a little couple of other little notes on one I was going to pull back and let people speak for a little bit Um, and let me get back to the idea also of the Ain Sof. I don't know if people understood the idea um, of the Ain Sof, that there is there exists. That is the aspect of the unknowable God that we cannot even perceive or fathom. We know it has to exist, but we can't even even perceive and comprehend what, what state exists in. Um, so I'll... Let me just stop talking for a minute if you have any questions or um, comments. And please absolutely do that. Um, So I'll get off the mic now. Um, Hi. Good evening, everyone. I hope uh, I ask if it's allowed to ask questions. If it is, it is? Okay. Okay. There were so many good points. Thank you for sharing, Isabel. I, you certainly enlighten me. I have a, well, the first question is this. Um, uh, what do you, what do you, can you elaborate a little bit more um, as far as, uh, you said that God doesn't need us. Um, he didn't ha- I, I forgot the, I forgot exactly, but uh, you said that God needs. Um, he made us because uh, he de- he pleased. He desired to make us. Can you uh, elaborate in in that? And also another question. Also, you said that Israel uh, on Mount Sinai, they were focusing too much of outside of. Uh, uh, themselves or God, uh, external of God rather than uh, internal. If you don't mind, I'm um, answering a little bit uh, 
Uh, I mean, elaborate a little bit more. I really like to understand. Thank you. Um, thank you. That was very good. Um, on the first, that I'll talk about the purpose of your existence in the planet. Um, to think that I know I'm speaking personally of myself, that I know that if this is all true, that there is a creator in the universe and he made all that exists, that anything I can contribute in this world could be done a billion times better by God himself. But but the amazing thing, the overwhelming thing, and the astounding thing is that he desires me. There's nothing that, that I can contribute that God couldn't do better or where he could create some being that could do better than me. But the point is he does desire us. The whole, the whole purpose of existence is to to have a relationship with our creator that that is number one God is one and he desires a relationship with his creation because he he calls he desires unity and the most amazing thing and the whole point of Judaism if you really start to look at and, and especially in Derek Hashem you'll see that he works his way up to a section called the Shema um, that it's absolutely about this intimate relationship with God and when you read the, it's not about you know God giving you livelihood it's not about God you know giving you a husband or a wife or good kids or success at your job or these things and you know these things are important to you yes that's really important because that's the world that we live in and this is the realm we function in we need a job we need we need good relationships with others we need success we need to be happy but the focus on those things and, you know, really sets a person up for disaster. And Israel was focused on those external things at that point. They were focused on not the essence of God, that he desired a relationship with them at that point. But they panicked. You know, Moshe's on the mountain. He's not coming down. And they started to panic. Rather than looking the essence of God, they're... Um, they really started to look on these external things. And the amazing thing is after the sin of the golden calf, you have something that God says, and it's a really important... Um, in Judaism, I'll read it if I can. It's a, a concept called, these are the 13 attributes of mercy of God. And so Moses goes up, and he carves out by hand now two stone tablets. I'm in Exodus chapter 34. So he's gone up to received the second set of commandments from God, the second tablet, not the same, the same commandments, but starting in 5, um, 34, 5, Hashem descended in a cloud and stood with him there, and he called out with the name, Hash, the name Hashem. Hashem passed before him and proclaimed, Hashem, Hashem, God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abundant in kindness and truth, preserver of kindness for thousands of generations, forgiver of iniquity, willful sin and error, who cleanses but does not cleanse completely, recalling the iniquity of parents upon the children and grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. And these are the 13 attributes of mercy. And if anybody would like, I can give you an app. I have a link to a mapping of these, these um, amazing attributes. And they're very important because Israel has just really disconnected they looked at they looked at these attributes of judgment and mercy and kindness of God, and they, but they didn't look at the essence of God. That God is God is a loving God. He's a kind God who overlooks these things, and He desires a relationship with Israel. And so, what happens after the, they disconnect? God gives them a way to reconnect. And so, all of these things, these intellectual pursuits, are not just to gain more knowledge. The study of Derek Hashem, what, why, why the Ram Kral is even writing this book, is not so you can come out with all this great knowledge and connectivity. That's really important, but knowledge and, 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 and learning have a point. It's, it's the, the song of songs. It's like it's a love affair. You're beginning a love affair with the creator of the universe who desires a relationship with you. And he wants you to know about him. If he didn't, there wouldn't be a Torah. There wouldn't be a revelation at Mount Sinai. And we wouldn't be here talking like this. Because we have an intrinsic need to relate to our creator. And God has created a pathway for us to come and to know him and to relate to him. And to um, have an intimate, open relationship with our God, which can be overwhelming. Because um, while people are made to be 
to um, relate and to have relationships with each other. It can also be a very, very scary thing. Look at Adam and Eve in the garden. Um, they made the same type of mistake that once they had um, partaken of that that tree <laughs> of the knowledge of good and evil, having that open relationship with their creator was absolutely overwhelming and they withdrew. They disconnected from God in a very big way. Um, so um, so I, I, said, I, I said before that God doesn't need us. He desires us and he does. But in any relationship... If you if you want to know the you want to know the essence of the other person, um, like any human relationship, if you love them because they're they're handsome or because they're successful or because they're um, you know they make you they make you laugh, those are really external things that you can find anywhere else, and it sets a, sets you up <laughs> sets anybody up for disaster. Because if you can find it anywhere else, then you don't need that person. You may want them at that point, but the point is that if you love them for who they are, that there is nobody like them in the universe. They are they are unique. They are amazing because of the the way of who they are in their true being. Then that is that is the kind of relationship that you're meant to have, and that's the kind of relationship that God wants with us. But you can't have that relationship. You can't understand that unless you have this intimate knowledge of the workings of God and what's important to God and how to serve Him. Just like you would. If you're, you know, looking for your spouse, you want to make them a good meal, or you want to know everything about them that you can. And so that's the point of the Rech Hashem. It's the way to serving God. So, okay, go ahead, Marcia. Oh, sorry. Okay, thanks. Um... I had a few questions, but it's 30 seconds per question. I wanted to ask from page 31, paragraph 3 says, These things are known by tradition from the patriarchs and the prophets. So I was just wondering, what traditions of the patriarchs are we, is he referring to there? Um, well, um, the short answer is he will bring them up. He does... He brings up some of these um, references, and you'll see as the Ram call um, elaborates on these on these ideas and concepts that he introduces at the very beginning. He'll bring more and more quotations, and he'll bring quotations from scripture and quotations from different um, sources within Judaism. And then, but there is in Judaism this large body of knowledge known as the oral tradition, and that creates a whole um, discussion in amongst itself. But that. Um, he does he does draw on a lot of these external sources and their understanding. Um, what makes the Ram call so amazing is well part of it is, is a lot of the things he says are not new per se, but it's the way that he connects them and it's the way that he is able to build up this really beautiful picture of all these different ideas and make them into a whole. Um, I hope that helps with your question. Oh the yeah, I was uh, just answering Marcy's question about what sources and what traditions. So, okay, go ahead. Thank you, Elise. Isabel. Uh, if we go back to uh, the discussion about the intimate relationship uh, with God, um, can can we say in um, can we say that uh, God made us? Uh, to love us and us to love him and it is mandatory to have that intimate relationship um, because often we, we, we look at the God oh we have to follow these rules and that but I think the way you represented God it's very different than what I've heard before so can we safely say that God has made us because he desires for us to have an intimate relationship with him, which is love. Can we say that? Thank you. Um, yeah, absolutely. I would, that's, that's the reason we exist, is to serve our Creator. Um, and Marcia, go ahead with more questions if you do have them. Um, yeah, it's very safe to say that that's, that's exactly why we're here. But like any relationship, there are correct ways correct boundaries. There are ways to 
relate that are appropriate and ways to relate that are inappropriate. So before we get into all these, you know, the, my, the specifics of observances, you see that the very one of the very last things that the Ram call talks about in Direct Shem is he builds the case for the relationship and then he says, okay, now we know that we have to relate to our Creator. Well, that's the reason we exist. That's the purpose of our existence in this world. Now that we know that, how do you relate to your Creator? So he brings us he brings us to this knowledge of this relationship and then he says, okay, now we know that God exists. We know we have a, should have a relationship with Him. And he'll bring you in, in later parts of the well, very quickly, actually, he'll bring into like how does this world function, and how how does that how do our actions in this world affect only, not only ourselves but the people around us? And so now you know you have a relationship, but there are consequences. And then at the very end of this book, he'll say, okay, now this is what God wants you. He likes this. This is this is the way God said you relate to me. It's not about if you truly do love Hashem. It's not about what you're doing for him or what he's doing for you it's about doing everything possible to to obtain that closeness to keep those channels open and um, so that it, I'm just giving you a very general overview right now so I'm trying not to be too specific and it can be hard at times go ahead Jacqueline um, Isabel I understand his his absolute independence his simplicity and his unity within himself. Okay, it's that word need. That's that's confusing to me because if you if because if if you look up the definition of the word desire, it is it, it, it it's he desires to have a relationship with us. Without us, he couldn't have a relationship with us. That's why he created us. So. He does need us, but not in his absolute independence within himself. But it is outside of his independence that I think that he needs us, but not within his, not within the unity and the simplicity of his absolute independence within himself. Am I understanding this correctly? It's 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 the word need that you know. Um, I don't think God needs us. Uh, in the sense that we need each other, but I think that he he to to have a relationship with someone, the desire and the need has to be there. You have to need that that relationship to be able to desire it. Um, I understand where you're coming from, but the idea is that. I don't want to think that God is callous and he doesn't care about our existence, but the point is, is existence is still existence whether or not I'm here. That that shows a very, you know, there's a, I'm trying to think of a line exactly, but there's a line in that Tiziaku song that I love that says, like, it, it, it's, existence goes on without you, cause, so in the end, it's not about you. It's not about you as an, as an individual. It's not about me as an individual. God doesn't need us and I think you know there's a point in the and I, I'm using this in quotes if you can see it as New Testament where Yeshua says you know if God wanted somebody to praise him he could he could raise up those rocks right now it's not is it it's not about that it's about that he desires you it transcends this need that I you know it's not even a want it's a, it's absolutely it's a desire I can't it's hard for me to put it into words um and you no, know, you could. The fact that I can cease to exist and the creation still could go on means that it's not just about me. But I am overwhelmed and I'm astounded by the fact that it is. At the same time, you know, it, it, there's the saying in Judaism that you have to say, you know, that the whole world is created just for you, meaning that it, it, it's that's not true if you look at it from the reality perspective. But that that you're here to experience creation, to relate to your, your creator. And one of the other things I want to point to is, and we'll, and, it gets, and we'll get into that in a little bit later section, is, you know, it's not about this aesthetic, you know, I'm withdrawing from creation. I'm going to, be, to become holy. To have a relationship with God, I've got to go to a, you know, a mountaintop and, and, um, and meditate for 30, you know, for, for 23 hours a day. It's not about that. In fact, um, 
it says you know there's saying that you you when you stand before God you're gonna have you're gonna have to stand and account for all the fruits that you didn't eat all the all the things that you didn't partake of in this world because creation exists for you for you to have a realm of vehicle with which you can relate to your fellow to, to your fellow human beings but to relate to God as well the point of existence is using these utilizing the resources that God has put in our lives our talents, our abilities, our, our financial resources, the physical, the physical location that we live in, the people that are in our lives, utilizing them in the correct way and relating to God and to others as creatures of spiritual beings that are unique. Not that you're going to like everybody, but that when you look at somebody, you think, they're a human being. How many times do you interact with people throughout the day? You know, you go to the grocery store, you go to the um, the, the bank, or you're with your fellow coworkers, and you stop and you think, you know, that person is a, you know, that bank teller. She she's a she's somebody's daughter. She's maybe somebody's mother. You know, she, and that's and that's the whole point of existence is to peel back that veil to understand that we are all here because God desires us to be here and creation exists because God constantly wills it into existence and the fact that we are able to function says a great deal about the essence of the creator who made this world, who made us and so the real challenge in our daily lives from the moment we get up to the time we go to bed is to not get lost in the details to not get focused on the on the um, outside but to, to always seek the essence true essence of a person of a, of a of a experience and that's a very very difficult thing to do because it's really hard to maintain that level of um, of focus at times so and, and there's other parts of the Ron Paul's book you see where where Judaism has built those things into your daily walk into your daily life to keep your focus on on Hashem and correct thinking all throughout the day. Oh, I don't know. Can you hear me now? Um, so I don't, I'll let the mic go for any other questions. Okay, yeah, okay. That would be good. Exactly. Yeah, what is man that you're mindful of him and the son of man that you think of him? And, and it's not a bad thing. It's, it's, it's amazing. So, Well, if you remember, is it Yeshua speaking? He says, you know, was it? He's looking, you know, the birds, you know, that God knows that God knows we have needs. God knows that we live in a physical world. I mean, He created existence, you know. So, so He's so God is always mindful of the fact that we live in a physical world. That we have we have need of money and clothing and shelter and all of these things. But that's the real struggle. That's the absolute struggle is to see beyond the veil, the hidden. The hidden aspects of nature to see beyond cre- our, our our own existence and to constantly look behind that and it really really changes if you try that just once just try that see how you relate to people it, it really does change how you interact with people in the world I know it did for me and I'm not saying like um, um, but it does change your perspective about creation and it's not a very easy thing to do and a lot of the questions, it's really like it's really hard to address the questions at this point because he really is focusing on really vague, general things. Um, so if you like, I continue. I can continue in chapter two, the purpose of creation, and read just a bit. Um, okay, I'll begin on page thirty-seven, chapter two, the purpose of creation. So we have here, God's purpose in creation was to bestow of his good to another. God alone is true perfection, free of all deficiency, and there is no perfection comparable to him. Any imaginable perfection, with the exception of God's, is therefore not true perfection. Other things may be said to have perfection, but it is only relative to something less perfect. Absolute perfection, however, is is only that of God. Since God desired to bestow good, a partial good would not be sufficient. The good that he bestows would have to be the ultimate good and that his handiwork could accept. God alone, however, is the only true God, and therefore his, benef- 
this beneficent desire would not be satisfied unless it could bestow that very good, namely the true perfect good that exists in his intrinsic essence. This is also true in another way. True good exists only in God. His wisdom therefore decreed that nature of this true benefaction could be his giving created things the opportunity to attach themselves to him to the greatest degree possible for them. Therefore, even though created things cannot emulate God's perfection in their own right, the fact that they can be attached to him allows them to partake of it. Since they can be considered part of God's perfection as a result of their association with him, thus they can derive pleasure from that true good to the greatest degree possible for them. The purpose of all that was created was therefore to bring into existence the creature who would, could derive pleasure from God's own good in a way that would be possible for it. Um, so getting back to the... I, I know I'm kind of beating on this again and again, but the point is is that there exists within each one of us here a unique being that can offer only what you can offer, who has, who is unique and important and special, who has a job, a function, a role in this world that only they can do, whether it's out and open in the public or the quietest one that possible, the most hidden job possible. But everyone is created with a purpose and with, and, um, the ability to create, to cling, to cleave to our creator. And, I know in this world, in the physical world, a lot of relationships and the way that people relate to one another is really mired down by the by the externals of the world, that a lot of the relationships that people have are because they're, foc they're focused on the external things, like this person makes me happy or this person does this for me, for me, for me, for me. And so that is the, that's the difficulty of this world and that is actually... Um, one of the side effects of being physical cre creatures in this physical realm is that is an easy way to relate to each other because we exist as physical creatures. But he says there exists a God who wants us to become perfect by cleaving to him. We can partake in that and be elevated to a really amazing um, place where and amongst ourselves, left our own devices, we couldn't reach. So... And that the only thing that God desires for us is good, absolute good, to the greatest degree possible. And that is, is it's a pretty amazing when you think about it. I know for me it is very amazing that there exists the creator, the creator of all things, that just just wants you, <laughs> not what you can do for them, not how much you, how hard you can work for them, but the fact that they, that Hashem desires you, just you. So, um, so he, he he says here that this, there was a creature that was created, and we can see very clearly from the book of Genesis that it is man. Um, so going on in 39, it says, God was, God's wisdom, however, decreed that for such good to be perfect, the one enjoying it must be its master. He must be the one who has earned it for himself and not give not given it accidentally or by chance. One sees that this arrangement is partially reminiscent of the perfection of God himself, to least, at least to the degree that this is possible for God's perfection is not a matter of chance either. God, however, is the one true perfection, being imperatively perfect, necessarily devoid of fault. This trait, in truth, is only God's, for no other being is perfect by necessity and devoid of fault by nature. Still, in order for a created being to come to resemble God to some degree, it is necessary that it at least earn the perfection that is not an imperative part of its being, and it must avoid the deficiency that is not precluded by its nature. God therefore decreed and arranged that creation contain elements of both perfection and deficiency, as well as a creature with equal access to both. This creature would, be, would then be given the means to both acquire perfection and avoid deficiency. By clinging to the elements of perfection, this unique creature would make itself resemble its creator at least to the degree that is possible for it. As a consequence, it becomes worthy of being drawn, drawn close to God to, to derive pleasure from his goodness. So you have in the Garden of Eden, Gan Eden, you have Adam and Eve set in creation in the most perfect existence possible. 
you have two beings unique in creation, the ability to perceive and live in both the spiritual and physical realm. And we'll get into, uh, the wrong call gets into the spiritual realm discussion in very shortly. So I know I'm skipping ahead a bit, but you have these unique creatures that existed in creation able to perceive God in the spiritual and physical realm like no other being unlike the angelic realm who are spiritual beings that couldn't interact with the, in the physical realm unless they had certain decrees by God to do so. Adam and Eve were free in the physical realm and the spiritual realm. And the wrong call uses the word deficiency because for, for man to be given the ability to choose, there has to be some type of withdrawing of God's light. He couldn't totally permeate creation or he'd overwhelm creation. So there exists a concept of, of of a withdrawal from like creating a vacuum per se, so that people have the ability to choose. But when God withholds a certain amount of his his light in creation, that causes deficiency. Um, and that deficiency allowed was it just the perfect balance? There was absolute. How do I say that? There's absolute symmetry in the universe. It's a really hard concept to convey, but with absolute symmetry, you don't have the perception of a beginning or an end. And so Adam and Eve existed in this state that we can't, I, I can't comprehend. <laughs> and what happened is they had one thing to do. He'll get into this. They had one thing to do, and that was to choose the good. Just like, just as Hashem desires to choose only good for us, he wants us to emulate him, and therefore he wanted Adam and Eve to choose the good. But you have in this whole dialogue with the serpent, you have Eve focusing for the first time in creation on the external. She's focused on one aspect of God, and that was his ability, the knowledge of good and evil, to actually perceive it and to know it. And so that was that disconnect that allowed them to um, continue further, um, setting them up for good for a big disaster, um, and that our perfection that we can obtain in this world, or a person can obtain in this world, is only because, like like he says, it's not intrinsic from within us. It's because of God, or compared to something that's less perfect. So. As we emulate God, as we um, as we partake in this world in a holy way, in the correct way, and we interrelate to God and to man in these prescribed limits that God's placed in this world, then we actually we actually do a great deal of repair to be undo the damage that was done, and we can draw ourselves and the whole world closer. Um, and. As we do so, as we cling to the Jesus, by clinging to the elements of perfection, that man um, can make that you can actually resemble God, and and there are ways and there are avenues that we can do that. So I don't know. Um, I can continue a little bit more. I don't know if anybody has any questions at this point. And yeah, the whole idea of okay, I'll keep going. Okay, by mean so let's see, I'm going in. Section 3 now, it's 39. Um, By means of acquiring perfection, this creature becomes fit to cleave to its creator, simply because through acquiring perfection it has, in a certain respect, begun to resemble its creator. Moreover, by incorporating elements of perfection into itself, it cleaves to the creator's perfection and thus and is drawn into him continually until ultimately its earning of perfection and its bonding and closeness to him are one matter. This is so because God himself is the only true perfection, and all perfection must therefore be associated with him as a branch is attached attached to its root. Therefore, even the root of perfection cannot be attained. All true perfection is ultimately derived and transmitted from this root. If we understand that God alone is the true perfection, it follows that in nature and in creations, every fault is merely the absence of his good and the concealment of his presence. That is, closeness to God and illumination of his presence is the root and cause of every perfection that exists, while concealment of his presence is the root and cause of every fault, the degree of deficiency depending on the degree of his concealment. Um, again, he's 
he's using that he goes to the analogy that's used a lot in the rest of the book, the the tree and the root, and it's used a lot in scripture as well. That um, the root, the one true source of all, is is God, and by partaking, becoming part of that tree, then we we partake of the root. We're not the root; we're only a branch. But we we can, through this closeness in the relationship, become one with our Creator. And I know the idea of earning can be very shocking to people. What is the end point? Well, <laughs> that's really hard to skip over. There's a lot of stuff that the Ram call goes over to get to the point where his point is here. But the the purpose we know we know that the purpose of existence is to cleave to our Creator, and that He talks about this idea of earning it. That um, I don't know if it, it <laughs> if you can imagine a relationship where it's one it's one sided. You know, where you know, sitting on the couch, you know, honey, bring me this, honey, bring me that. You, know, you don't, where you never do, you never try and do for the other person. And so the idea is that in this earning, and I, the word is earning, is there are actions that we have to make an effort to relate to God. That this world that we exist in is this period of effort, this period of seeking, of struggle, of self-introspection, of overcoming our weaknesses and our faults to triumph over them in this world is a world of struggle. And that by doing so, you know, it's like we take a baby step and God takes the next leap. And so, but it does require the baby step in this world. Oh, are we going, I don't think so. I'm looking at the time for the timing. Yeah, probably, probably not much beyond 2.5. Um, but that in this world that we God does require that effort, that seeking, and that God will meet us there. He'll He'll meet us the the rest of the way. And that is if if you remember, um, you know, Cain is contemplating killing his brother, and Hashem comes in, is crouching at the door. But you can overcome it if you choose to. If you choose to, meaning that if you make the effort, there I will. You know, the rest of the rest of the work will be done. Um, so I'm going to close with this, and then we'll go um, we'll go into open discussion. We are in. I guess I could end in five. I'll end in five. But that um, I'm sorry, I got a little off track. But that the end point of all of this is cleaving to our Creator, and that we have to make the effort that once the effort is made on our behalf God will meet us there because he says he bestows he wants only good for us he wants only um, he's a loving God he's chesed he's full of mercy like the attributes of mercy um, and that as a result of, of us cleaving to God then we can become perfected beings that resemble him I'm sorry. Um, let me go here did I read three? said by means of acquiring perfection Oh, I forgot where I left off. My apologies. By means of acquiring perfection, the creature becomes fit to cleave to its creator. I think I read that, right? I read 2.3. I think I was getting... Um, yep, I did. Okay, my apologies. And so he talks again about the deficiencies that exist, that if there's any... He's using the word evil... But if there's deficiency, if there's evil in the world, it's 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 a direct result of the of the concealment of God's influence in this world. And as a result, and that can happen one of two ways. One, man through his actions, through our actions, we can cause God to we can conceal God's perfection, we can conceal God's light in this world. And the other way is through our actions, God's light and presence can withdraw, we can contract from this world. In that nothing. So if you understand that principle that 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 their fault, the the um, evil that pervades the world is simply a matter of concealing God's presence, then the solution becomes very clear. Through our actions, we got to work very diligently through serving God to open that to open those gates back up to clear to um, to to allow more of God's perfection to exist in creation, to allow for more God and light to exist. And through us and our creation, through us, we are the vehicles that that happens. And it's through our actions or inactions that causes um, God's light to come into a greater degree or conceal it. 
and that's just the way he set it up. And he and he gets into why that's true in in, in another section. So I'm I can just continue a little bit more. Let's see, I think this is a unique creature which stands. Okay, I think I left off it. Um, the second paragraph in 41. If we understand that God alone is the true perfection, it follows that in nature and creation... I already read that. I'm sorry, I'll read a little bit more. Every fault is merely the absence of his good and the concealment of his presence. That is, the closeness to God and illumination of his presence is the root and cause of every perfection that exists, while concealment of his presence is the root and cause of every fault, the degree of deficiency depending on the degree of his concealment. Again, you can't state that enough, that God's light is in this world to the degree that... Um, Mankind allows it in some extent. There is a unique creature which stands balanced between the elements of perfection and the elements of deficiency, which in turn are the result of God's illumination or concealment. When this creature strengthens himself, striving for elements of perfection, incorporating them into his being, this in a way is the means of clinging to God, blessed be his name, as he is their root and source. The more elements of perfection this creature incorporates into himself, the stronger will be the association and bond to God. He becomes, so to speak, attached to God himself, driving both pleasure and perfection from his goodness, while he himself is the master of his good and perfection, having acquired them by choosing them. Choose life that you may live. That's what the Torah says. Choose life that you may live. Choose to serve God. Become a conduit through which he can, his light can flow into this world, and you can bring a great degree of healing, of repair, that cannot imagine. You can't always see either. You have no this one really profound concept that the that the Ram Call talks about later on is the degree to which our actions can really change the world in an unseen way. Because we are spiritual creatures when Adam and Eve partake partook of that tree and they ate that fruit and they fell, they didn't cease to become spiritual beings. It's their perception of the spiritual realm became veiled. It's like God put on a giant, he put on a veil, and he hid his true presence and the true effects of what our, of our actions are behind the veil of nature. And so we are still spiritual beings. We still have effect, we can still affect profoundly the spiritual realm through our own actions. And we can affect the physical realm through our own actions. The problem in this world, at the state after Adam and Eve sinned, is that we don't always see those consequences. We can't always see the connection between the physical and the spiritual realm. It takes a great degree of attachment to God to be able to perceive that again. It takes a great degree of work and um, effort in relating to God to be able to get to the point where Adam and Eve were, where they could perceive physical, spiritual. For them, there was no difference. And you can see there are people in Scripture that obtain that at times, but they, even those great men and women of Scripture don't keep that state at all times. And so that is the, that's the quandary we're in now. We are physical beings, we're spiritual beings, but we're disconnected. They're, they're not, um, there's not that absolute mingling of physical and, and, and spiritual as there once was. So we go about our daily lives and we may not always perceive what great spiritual damage or great spiritual repair that our actions are doing. And so in this world we see people who are evil that, you know, they're, they, they just do horrible things but they're rich and they're successful and all of these things and people ask why. Or you see people who are loving and generous and kind and they suffer and they have, you know, horrible things seem to happen to them and you can't say why. Well, it's interesting that you say that about Yeshua because where the Ram Call says here, um, when the creature strengthens himself, striving for elements of perfection, incorporating them into his being, in this way, a means of clinging to God, blessed be his name, it's, um, I don't want to get in too much, but it's pretty interesting that's like kind of like, I don't know, like the machine. <laughs> um, it's, but he's not saying Yeshua here, and I don't, I want to take one quick step back. This isn't trying, I'm not trying to tell you that, you know, this is the book that you're going to be able to prove she was the Messiah. That's not my point. My point is not that at all. I don't want to tell you what to think. I'm not here to do that. I, 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 this is the book that I just want to present Ron Paul in the best way that I can in my very limited faculty to try and convey some of the messages that he's speaking and 
like I said, there are there are a lot of great teachers who have done this before, <laughs> and I don't I don't pretend to be one of them. But um, what I'm trying to say here is that we have the ability to to do great spiritual repair and damage dependent upon our actions, and we don't always perceive the consequences of our actions in this world because creatures, physical creatures, with the ability to to affect a world that we can't even comprehend is a pretty scary thing. Um, so uh, I'll just read this a little bit more and then I'll close up after this because it's almost done with this section. Now being that the creation in general must contain these different elements, elements of perfection and elements of deficiency as mentioned, and it must contain a creature who has the potential and ability for both to acquire perfection and avoid deficiency, being given the means to acquire perfection, it follows, without question, that the world in general must contain great multitudes of different elements of each type in varying relationships to one another, so that the purpose for the world be realized. The creature destined for this great condition, namely a bond of closeness to him, is considered the main element of all creation. All else in existence is only an aid in some aspect or regard towards this goal to have it succeed and become reality. They are therefore all considered secondary to this primary creature. I'll just finish here. This primary essential creature is man. All other created things, whether above or below, only exist for his sake, to complete his environment through their various different qualities appropriate for each of them. This will be discussed in a later and more detail. The elements of perfection which man must strive to perfect in himself are his intellect and his positive character traits. On the other hand, for the sake of acquiring perfection, the elements of deficiency that man must avoid are the material and mundane matters of the world and negative character traits. The idea that we all have mitos, that we have characteristics that are unique to us and that we have we have in an imperfect form. And um, in this world, it's our job to perfect, perfect them and to use them in the proper context, in the correct way. And um, through doing so, we elevate ourselves in our relationship with God and we profoundly affect creation as well by allowing more of God's presence into the world. And everything that exists in this world is either for us to derive pleasure from to or to avoid. And there, because the Torah, the um, contains both positive and negative commandments. And by choosing the good and saying no to those things that are forbidden, that we do a great deal of um, spiritual repair. And as a result, we have a pathway to, to do exactly this, this method to connect to God. And so we have in this creation, you have certain religions that, you know, like Catholicism, they have their monks that go and and they, you know, they avoid the pleasures of this world in an effort to become holy. Whereas in Judaism says that's the absolute opposite of the whole point. The whole point is to connect, not disconnect. And so the greater the greater thing is to be able to take eating and drinking and relationships and to elevate them and to do them in a way to serve your creator with everything. That's the whole point. To love the Lord all of you, your heart, your desires, your emotions, your physical possessions, everything is there for you to utilize in a way to serve God and to to bring Tikkun, which is an idea of repair to the world, to yourself, to your family, to the people that God puts in your pathway, to Tikkun, to repair your relationship with God. And so, instead of withdrawing from the world, God wants you to become partakers of it in a great way. One is, I don't know if, if anyone's caught in the Torah portions that we have the idea of the tithe, but if you look, you see that a lot of the tithe went to the person bringing the tithes. They said, you, you, part of the tithing cycle, it was a cycle, it was you go and you you go and get you get food, you get drink, and you go to the temple and you have a party and you serve God with joy. 
And this is really an important concept that now it's Sukkot, and the Torah is called the Man Sukkotenu. This is the time of our joy, of our rejoicing. You just come through this really heavy period of Elul and these high holy days, and you have all of these things that you, you've just diagnosed that are wrong with you. And rather than being sorrowful and so, sorrowful and saying, you know, oh my, you know, I just, you know, I'm still saying that I'm doing the same things wrong as I was last year. How can I not? How can I be so horrible? I can't change. It's like, no. Thank God that you have that ability to look at yourself, and you have, you now know what you need to work on. Rather than looking at these characteristics and seeing your hopeless sinner that will never change, you said, no, this is, this is exciting. You now know what the problem is. You've just got a diagnosis. Go out and work on it. And so we have Sukkot, this time period for us to take in and to really, with joy, say, you know, these are the things that are making me disconnect from the people around me, from my relationship with God. And I'll read one of the, um, I have, uh, what did I put it? I lost, oh, here it is. This, I have to find this um, link. Um, some of the, this is a rabbi who wrote um, about these attributes of mercy, and I was going to read a couple of his quotes. The Hashem. So one of the things he says, Hashem is beyond our tolerance, meaning that he's. He lowers himself to clean up our messes directly. We can we can actively and directly help us. That God is God comes to us to have us relate to Him, and He says that God calls us calls Israel His wife, calls Israel His daughter, His sister, and He allows He allows Israel, well, and all of us to attach to part of Him, and He partakes of our joy, He partakes of our suffering. And as a result of all these things, you know, because you have God being very emotional in Scripture, and 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 as a result, we have how do we relate to the world? We relate through our emotions. We relate through um, our senses. And so the whole point of all of the Ram Call is saying that you know everything that you have, everything around you, your emotions, your 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 abilities. Everything is here for you to have a relationship with God. And rather than running from it and becoming a monk or, you know, and you know, flogging yourself, you have you have the job, the duty, and the responsibility to partake of this world in a holy way and to transform these liabilities into assets and to serve God with them. Yeah, exactly. Every, you're unique. You can't... And, you know, part of the idea of repair is is you are part of creation. You are an aspect of creation. And by doing, by focusing on these characteristics, bringing the good characteristics out and changing the bad, that you actually are repairing creation by repairing yourself. So anyway, I'll let people have any questions or anything. Please go ahead. Well, thank you, uh, Isabel. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I have uh, actually a couple of questions. I don't know how long can I ask the question. 30 minutes? 30 seconds? Or can I take longer? Anyway, let me, let me just put it this way. Uh, you have, uh, you have uh, explained the definition of relationship to, to some degree between God and, and uh, human being, right? And uh, we're often Often we, as a human being, we think that God gives us these rules and laws to follow Him, and we often think, oh my gosh, in order for me to uh, have receive good things from God, I have to follow these uh, uh, rules and regulation. But tonight, you have uh, really uh, changed my thought about this. Uh, uh, is, am I understanding this correct? The rules and regulation that God has gave us, it's not per se because, uh, because, uh, uh, what, what we need or what He needs, it's because merely to have, that is the only way to have a good relationship with Him. Can we safely say that? Can you elaborate in a little bit more? about that, uh, instead of us looking at these laws and regulation as a burden, 
we can look at it, no, this is the, the only way that we can have relationship with God. Uh, am I understanding it right? Thank you. Um, ex- exactly. It's exactly that, that, that these methods that, it, not to, to use an analogy, it's like, it's like any relationship. You're not going to get along very well with someone if you are doing everything that absolutely drives them crazy and annoys them. It's the, there are, we are all, we all have things that we, we enjoy, that we like, that we need, that we want in a relationship with others, whether it's a friend or a spouse or a brother or a sister. And um, as a result that, you know, it's a poor analogy, but that but that's exactly it. These are the methods through which, you know, this is what I like, this is what I need. If you want to pursue a relationship with me, then you're going to have to, you know, we'll meet each other on these terms and and that's what those are for it's not a method to you know to just it's not God crouching and waiting for you to get something wrong so he can hit the smite button as soon as you got it wrong it's it's absolutely desires a relationship with us desires good and chesed but like any healthy relationship there are boundaries and there are ways that you approach each other that are correct and incorrect and that's exactly it thank you yeah, for me personally, that's that's beautiful because with any relationship, I mean, if somebody wants to have a relationship with you, there are certain rules that they'll have to follow. I mean, they're not they can't do whatever they want. They can't act however they want to act. They can't run around with if you're a woman, they can't go running around with every woman they see. You have rules. You have uh, basic qualifications that anybody must you know that they must have before you will really have a loving relationship. Why should it be so difficult for people to think God is any different? Um, to me, it's one of those things that it's the, the, the physical mimics the spiritual. There are rules. There are criteria that we all have for relationships with other people. And if they do not fulfill those criteria, if they're, if they're uh, filthy or if they're uh, if they do something, if they have a habit you don't like, well, you won't have a relationship with them. Why should it be any different with God? Uh, but anyway, real quick, one of the beautiful things for me, basically, is, or Isabel, was really, and I don't know if it's actually covered in this section, uh, is the, the issue that I mentioned of challenges, of how God, we each have unique challenges. And when I, came, when I read that, it, it, a light went off in my head. All the frailties and weaknesses that I have, I now view them as specific challenges God has given me to overcome as part of my growth so that I can establish that relationship with him. And also, in, a, in my own little part, through a ripple effect, repair creation. Anyway, uh, I'll release the mic. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, I hope it's not bothersome that I ask. So many questions. Well, I, I want to um, uh, use an example. You were saying, for instance, you know, every relationship, let's say, between a husband and wife, uh, there is usually uh, a motive, you know, whether we like it or not. We, we get married or we have relationship with someone because we need something, you see? Because what what we want to get, you know, for our our own self, and as well as we want to also give. So, how do you define uh, our relationship with God? Is it also because what uh, should we should we say that uh, should we have relationship with God based on what He gives us? Is it justified to think of that? Because if you remember in Torah, Deuteronomy chapter 28, uh, uh, Elohim was saying to Moses, tell Israel, you know, if you follow my commandments, all these blessings will come upon you. And and if you don't follow, all these curses will come upon you. So, in other words, is, uh, uh, Elohim is saying that if you follow me, follow my rules, these, uh, I have something good to give you. Uh, are we supposed to love God because what he gives us or because of himself? 
I hope it's not a complicated question. Um, no, it's actually a very good, very good question. And there are ways that Israel, and you can see the way that Israel relates to God many times, it puts them in a very, in a position where they're very close to sitting and turning away from God. Because when you start to look at what God does for you, then, um, you know, loving God or serving God because of what you get sets you in my <laughs> sets a relationship up for failure and it sets in a, and you look when Israel relates to the external of God meaning the blessings and the curses then it sets them up for failure too if you look to God for money or success or power there are other methods you know other ways to obtain money and power and success and happiness and joy and fulfillment in other ways in this world in a very in a very shallow way but there are other channels one of the ways that the horse says you know there's another channel open to you it's called witchcraft if you do it then you're very you're, you, you've really done a great deal of damage if you choose to to, to do avodah zara which you tru, choose to serve it's not like i said it's not really idolatry it's serving it's serving strange gods it's serving strange things. it's disconnecting from god you do that by setting yourself up by looking at the externals and when Israel is focused on, on those external things then, then God really chastises them and there's a way that, you know serving God for out of fear of retribution out of fear of um, consequences and out of a hopeful expectation that you're going to get a reward people do it all the time that's why there's a 50% divorce rate in the world and that's why Israel went into exile again and again and again and so it's, and this is what the Ram calls trying to say is focus on the essence of God as a being, not what you, not what God can do for you, and that, but that you have the ability to relate to God, that God is loving, He's, He's kindness, He's enumerating a lot of the essence of God at the very beginning. He's, um, He's enumerating that you know God is a God of He desires only good for you. He desires mercy. He desires to bestow upon you the ability to cleave to Him. He gives you a way to relate to Him, and so it's those healthy relationships that um, that we seek in this life. And it's a desire. We are creatures created to relate to the world, and 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 to create created to relate to our Creator as well, and so. How do you serve God and how do you create that intimacy with God and with other people? It's when you start focus, stop focusing on external things and you look at the essence of who they are, their good characteristics, what makes them unique, what makes them different from anybody else in the world. And you're not, you know, you're not meant to, to relate to every human being on that way, that way, you know, but the same is true about God. We're here to search out the characteristics of God, the attributes of God, and not just focus on serving Him because we're afraid of retribution, we're afraid of fear. Who wants a relationship with another person because they're afraid of what you can do do to them? You know, it's like, can a king or a queen have really any true friends? Because if they have absolute authority and power, how will you ever know that they love you? Well, uh, that, that their friends are really truly their friends. And that's what God wants to know from you. He, yeah, He has the power to, do, you know, to, to end your existence immediately. And all of these curses could come upon Israel immediately, but that's not what it's about. It's about do you desire God and God alone? And, um, and so by enumerating these characteristics and working on your own, like, it, it's, it's a give and take. You are, God desires that you, you work on these characteristics too and doesn't expect perfection from you doesn't expect you to get it all right at once but he does expect effort and and when we make the effort um, and we see there's a disconnect there's a lot of people in the world that don't believe in God that they say they don't believe in God and, and you ask well why well because there's there's evil in the world and people get hurt and people suffer and what they're saying is I believe in my heart that God is truly good and when I take a look at the world and I see people suffering without a reason I don't understand it. There's a disconnect. And so that is the challenge in this world, is to look beyond the physical realm and see, okay, well, yeah, there is evil in the world. Why does it exist? How come it's here? And what can I do to change it? And so the wrong call saying is 
people in their heart really do have a desire. Even people who seem to be very hostile and negative towards God, they really do desire a relationship because they believe that there should be goodness in the world. And that's a really important principle. They know that God should be good and that there should only be good in this world. And when it's not the case, then, then people look at the external things and they don't search beyond, they don't try to peel back the layer and say, okay, what's going on here? And if you get to the point in, in a lot of physical, you know, in the relationships, especially in like marital relationships, where people get to the same point. You know, you know it's supposed to be good. You know you're supposed to connect. When that disconnection happens, and what, what do people do? Some people react in pain when the, when the, the correct thing is to, to, you know, examine yourself, change yourselves, and to try and meet each other halfway and try and work together on this relationship. And that's what God desires at a very deeper level with us. I don't know if that makes sense. I'll get off the mic. Personally, I think that God works with us, or that he utilizes what is intrinsically natural for us. We don't love people out of fear. We love people who take care of us. We love people who treat us well. One thing I like about uh, the Judaic writings is that they emphasize very strongly that everything we have in this world comes from God. When I go to the coffee machine every, at work to get a cup of coffee, I thank, I thank Hashem for that because God has provided that coffee. I live in an apartment with heating and cooling. God has provided that heating and cooling. I can order a pizza. Oh, I don't have to go kill anything and skin it and eat it. I can order a pizza. It's hand-delivered to me. I don't never have to turn the stove on. God has, has blessed me with that. Every single thing in our life, if you, if, you can, if you can learn to go through life recognizing everything as a blessing from God, you will grow in your love for God. Because you will begin to recognize he provides everything for you. And it is natural for humans to love those who take care of them. It's natural. We love those who take care of us. We don't love those who threaten us. God takes care of us. God does not threaten us. There is a threat, but the, the caretaking is far, far greater. And so that's one of the things that personally I like about Judaic thought is the emphasis on everything we have coming from the Most High God. Everything, no matter how small. And I would just encourage people to, as you go through life, no matter in your day, no matter how small something may be, your drive to work is safe. The living God blessed you to get to work safely. Your car is running. It hasn't broken down. The living God is blessing you with a car that functions. Everything we do in life, every blessing we have, if you can look to that as being a blessing for the Most High God, it will, it will enhance your love for God. Uh, Mike is free. When I look to Hashem to understand love, since Hashem is all love, then His creation could not show me that love. To the point of completion only Hashem can show this to us and I in return love him with the love he desires not the love of the world and how they love each other because they love each other for what they can get that, that's like saying okay Hashem I will love you as long as you do good things for me I can't, I can't go down that road. Uh-uh. can't. I cannot go down a road that says, okay, Hashem, I'm going to love you as long as you love me. I'm going to be obedient. That was my question. Is, is, I, my, behind, I don't understand this. This is like, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't think Bruce had a question either, but okay. Um, yeah, but just real quick. I, 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 would, I would hesitate to agree with you, Jackie, on one point that we do have the ability to, we, we have the ability to emulate our Creator, both in our relationship to God, between God and ourselves, but also in our, how we relate to other people. And the generalization that, you know, every people that 
a lot of relationships aren't healthy, but there are a lot of really healthy relationships too because people take the time to relate to others in in the way that is correct and that it's um it is possible in this world if you're trying to emulate your creator to to love them in the true way, which is not for the external things, you know, but for the for the essence of who they are. Because a lot of those external things will fade away in human relationships, and then you have only the essence of the person left. And unless that, unless you really feel like that person is irreplaceable, that there's nobody like them, and that's true, that you have to see that and you have to live that way, then you can have um, some you can have some dire consequences, but that is possible in this world. There are a lot of healthy relationships and no, we can never love God love people the way that God loves us, but we are we're required to at least try and to emulate him. And instead of looking them looking at people as, as just, you know, well that's the bus driver or that's the teller, like looking them as human beings that have been created and created by God with a purpose and a function in it that's unique to them. And when you interact with people, it's not like you're going to say, you know, you're not going to walk up to the teller and say, what do you want in life? You know, what's the most important thing to you as a person? You know, she's going to give you, she's going to look like you're crazy because that's crazy. But when you interact with people, know that they have, yeah, they have an intrinsic value in amongst themselves. It's not just the bank teller. They're, they're somebody that God created for a purpose. Exactly. So I think that if you have that perspective as you go throughout your daily life, you know, just with the strangers, people that you don't know well, but even more so with your family, that really changes the perspective of what a relationship is. So, okay, I'll get off the mic. Hey, um, Isabel, I'm, I'm gonna kind of extend my question a little bit that I asked in text a while back. When you were talking about, you know, when Adam and Eve when they sinned, you know, there was that disconnect. That, you know, the um, the the spiritual is kind of overshadowed by the our natural. Uh, that we see here on, on the earth and everything. And it seems like that the Almighty is, is consistently trying to reconnect, reconnect with his creation, like he does with, like with Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, and etc. Um, how does, how does the Almighty do that reconnect and, and, and does Mashiach have a role in that as well? Go ahead. I'm done. Um, yeah, it's, the concept of Mashiach is a very deep concept, and um, it's really difficult to talk about Mashiach and and the function in creation without going through some of the principles that the Ram Kal has in his book later on, because the, the the function of Mashiach is based on some really amazing principles and um, pretty deep ones, and. Um, <laughs> It's really, I, I, I don't want you to think that I'm not answering you, but there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of concepts that go in behind the idea of Mashiach and why is there Mashiach and how does the, how does that function of Mashiach work in this world and why do we need a, why do we need a Messiah? What's all of this about? And so, um, coming up very quickly in, in the next chapters of um, the Ram Call, he states a very, without using even the word Messiah, Mashiach, he states a really amazing case for for why we need this, this function in the role of Mashiach. And he sets up some really important principles that show exactly why we'd need it, but, what, but more importantly, um, how would Mashiach affect the individual. And... Um, and the amazing thing about the spiritual realm is that it transcends time. And so um, some of the concepts coming up in, 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 that are introduced in the, in the spiritual realm, um, human responsibility, and then you get into the idea of prov- individual providence and um, in the sections. He talks, he builds up these really amazing cases. So you get to the point like, wow, that's exactly what you, you know, that, that's it. You go, you can read Isaiah now, you read Ezekiel, and you see these concepts so, so differently. And so you can take a step forward and you examine history and say, okay, is there anybody in history that fills this function? So, um, how does that, it's, it's, it's very, very difficult. And there's a lot of Midrashim that actually talk about, um, like, how Abraham and Isaac and Jacob related to God. And um, the 
role of the Mashiach transcends time as well. That function that I hate using that word office, but that but that function the Mashiach transcends time as well. Um, I don't know if that's been helpful for you at all. <laughs> no, Isabel. I mean that, that's fine. I understand the the role of uh, Mashiach is very lengthy and meaty discussion. I was just kind of curious because it, you know, it, it just seems like ever since the fall of man, that the Mashiach, and not the Mashiach, sorry, the Father, is 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 constantly, you know, putting out his hand to to bring back his creation, to to reconnect to his creation and stuff like that. And, and you know, I it's, I see that, you know, with with the covenants that he's making. But when you said that there was that connect and disconnect, I was just like, you know. What is our role in, in that connection? Is it, you know, obeying just the Torah? Is it more than just the Torah? Uh, you know, the intimacy. And I'm sure this will probably get discussed later on more and more into the book. So you, you don't have to answer my question. If, if you want to, that's fine. If, if you want to just type in or just say, hey, this will get discussed later on, that's okay. I just, you know, just kind of curious. You just got me thinking and thinking and it just, yeah, I'm done. Um, uh, next can go. Sorry. Thank you. Um, if uh, if if there is still time, and if uh, if this question is related to what you were talking, Isabel, I would appreciate it if you can uh, elaborate a little bit about uh, 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 the the connection uh, between us following the commandments. How does this uh, following commandments related to um, uh, have an intimate relationship with God. Is it possible? If it's not possible, it's okay. But if you can elaborate in that, I really appreciate. Thank you. Um, actually, it, it kind of addresses both points. Um, one that David brought up as well. Um, with the. I hate using the word with the fall. It is a fall. With the fall of Adam and Eve, we, we talked about that spiritual disconnection that we didn't cease to be the functioning spiritual beings or physical beings, but our spiritual our spiritual eyes, <laughs> I, so to say, were blinded at that point. And as a result, um, our perception of our actions we're basically groping around in the dark when it comes to spiritual things most of the time. And it's like, um, you know, groping around in the dark in a china shop. You're going to do a lot a lot of damage if you aren't careful, if you don't have a map of how to go. So a lot of the, if you look in, in the consequences, the ultimate consequence of the Torah, the it's not the, it's not the exile from the land. It's not the it's not that you know people the the horrible punishments that come upon Israel. It's that you will cease to have spiritual sensitivity. That's the ultimate thing. It's not even the death penalty. The ultimate the ultimate um, consequence of Torah is being cut off spiritually. Cut off that even that thread that inkling that you have connecting you to God that keeps you a spiritual sensitive being that doesn't plunge you over the side of absolute evil can be disconnected. God can just hang up the phone. And that's not what you, that's death. Disconnection is death. And so without constant striving, without constant work, that state that Adam and Eve enjoyed, which was, you know, they basked in this in this close relationship with God and it didn't require a great deal of effort. They had one command. Don't eat that tree. Everything else is taken care of. And you can see as Israel disconnects further and further from God that more and more commands are put upon them, that the effort required by them to can, just to get their spiritual state in a correct way so they can actually commune with God takes a lot more effort. And um, as a result, it's like you, he, God doesn't want you to be blind. He wants you to know, you know, there are there are principles in the world that if you violate them, you do a great deal of damage. And at times... For us who are encompassed in this physical reality, it's really hard to understand why some of these commandments make no sense. It's like what? So what I eat matters to God, you know? 
why? 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 Well, you know, you're a spiritual being. You don't know because everything has a, has an essence. Everything has a spiritual source. It's not physical. That that pork sandwich has a physical manifestation in this world. True, but it also has a spiritual essence, and it can profoundly affect your soul. You're not a physical being. You are spiritual too, and so. In this world, it may be very difficult to comprehend why some of these commandments exist, but they exist for us to be able to relate. Not that that we have to do all of these things; that God's going to like not have a relationship with us. That we have to do these things to to get to that point where Adam and Eve were, God willing, and if you can, in this world where we can actually perceive and hear and and, and God, because when we when our our soul, once it has this connection to this physical world, is dying. And the only way we can give it little injections of energy is when we when we cleave to God. It's like, uh, you know, the branch the branch and the root analogy. You know, you enter the world in this really, you know, half sawed off state. The branch is almost it's barely hanging on by a thread, and so that connection is really important to nurture that as much as you can. And to do that, it's like the prescription of a you know a physician giving you a prescription for uh, for an ailment. It's like you may not understand the biochemistry behind the medications you're taking. You may not understand how it all works, but you're going to trust this this physician that that you need to have this to continue um, on um, a pathway of physical health. It's true in the spiritual realm as well, and. Um, like I said, the, the the most the most horrible thing that is called death is that disconnect. That one, you can reach the point where God just hangs up the phone. You went too far. He doesn't hang up the phone. In actuality, it's your actions that cause that. You cut yourself off from God. You you have such a degree of deficiency through your actions that there's absolutely no room for anything else but you know death. So I don't know if that made any sense. Isabel, God has sent you tonight, at least for me, to enlighten me to ways that I've never, 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 nobody has ever thought about. Uh, talk to me to make me understand God the way God has used you to make me understand. And I'm, I'm grateful to God, and thank you. Um, and I apologize if I ask too many questions. I sincerely want to help. I want to learn. Um, can I ask you this? I don't know. Um, I, I, when uh, when God made us, were we, in spite of uh, us having a physical body, were we spiritual being? And uh, are we still spiritual being? Um, even if the, if a person is still in sin and never goes back to God, are we a spiritual being, or our spiritual being depends on the walking with God? I, I don't understand that. That, if you don't mind, thank you. Well, the Ram call talks about this period of earning and striving that we have to go through as creatures in this world and um, and this is really important because once you're cut off from the physical realm through death you don't have the ability to change anything here anymore so the the purpose the blessing is that we have this life as hard as it can be as difficult as it can be we have the ability to affect all levels of creation while we exist in this physical world if we choose to and the problem as I stated before is we don't always understand how our physical actions even our, our thoughts can affect creation but they do because we are unique in this creation we are unique beings we're not like the angels we're not like the demons we're not we are we have amazing ability to impact the world around us both physically and spiritually and what the meaning of cut off is not that your spirit dies but that connection that ability for your spirit to, your, I hate using the word spirit for your soul to influence your body as weak as the connection is it still has it has an influence the way that your soul can influence this world is only through your physical body at this point 
and um, <clears throat> the greatest thing you can do is to cut that off and to cut off that association to close the to close the channels of communication um, and as a result then your ability to do to shoot there's a concept in in, in the Torah called teshuva meaning to return it's not necessarily repentance that's an aspect of it but it really, literally means to return and it's to turn return you back into the that the correct spiritual state that you're supposed to be in. So I'll let you go. Yeah, I mean, actually, to me, it's profound the way um, what, what you what Elizabeth just said. We we're all born. You know, a lot of times people are asking, you know, what's the meaning of life? What is? Why am I here? What is my meaning? You know, what's what use is, is is it that I'm here? And it is very profound to realize that each one of us have a role to play in perfecting a creation. Each one of us can bring down the blessings of the Most High God. Every one of us, we can affect creation. We can affect it in a physical way, and we can affect it in ways that we cannot perceive. That every single one of us can bring down the light of the Most High God to creation. And that that is, that is a purpose, that we each each of us have a meaning. Each of us have a purpose. Each one of us can affect creation. And uh, when a person realizes that, and it's very profound, it really is, when a person recognizes that, it really changes your perspective on life in general. When you realize the value that you actually possess, when you realize that you are here for a purpose, and that, that that purpose is to affect creation, to bring down the light of Hashem to the world. It's a ripple effect. I mean, it's hard to describe, but for me, it is it is it is truly, and I've used the word three or four times. It really is profound, uh, and it, and it causes the person to recognize that we do, each of us do have. A meaning for we have a reason for being here. There is meaning to life, to every life, and uh, it, it's uh, better be covered a lot more. I, I would just real briefly say that if you do not have the book, uh, The Way of God by Moshe Kamozato, it is extremely uh, highly recommended you get it and read it. It will assist you drastic dramatically in this uh, in this discussions that are going to be going on. And it will also help you to understand what is being discussed, because she is going through the book. Very, very, very good book. Uh, Bahanu can, Olive Bahanu can, uh, if you go to his website, he'll show you how to get the book. It is a very good book. Um, you really need to get the book. It's going to be difficult to fully grasp and follow along unless you have the book. And you'll be glad you got it. It is, um, there aren't adjectives uh, sufficient to describe the value of that book. You you will truly uh, it, it will change your life. It will cause you to to understand truth and God and Scripture like you possibly never have before. Seriously, it will. Uh, and and I can't describe that. You you have to experience it, and you can only experience it if you read the book. Uh, the mic is free. Um, BC, this is to answer your question. Yeah, absolutely. That's the whole function of this. It talks about the Zadikim, these righteous individuals that exist, and that's the whole function of them is there's a concept, and it's hard to convey, and I'll just give it real brief if I can, that most people in the world fall on this continuum. I don't know if anybody is familiar with the, you know, the statistical bell curve that, like, a lot of creation just falls in the bell curve when you when you when you chart things that are similar they fall in this beautiful bell curve um, kind of a pattern and the idea is that most people aren't completely evil and most people aren't completely you know righteous but most of us fall in this spectrum of the bell curve and the idea is that <clears throat> if that weren't so if we weren't a mixture if we weren't trying to do good with some bits of, you know, messing it up every so often that, you know, society just wouldn't function. 
if be if people weren't trying to be good. You know, think of it would be chaos. There wouldn't be enough police to control every human being on the planet if everyone is out for evil all the time. And so, but the point is, there are some people who are more who are more um, that are closer to God and striving harder to serve Him, and other people who are messing it up. The word, the, the primary word for sin in, in the Tanakh is chet, is a is the idea of a mistake or a de- falling short, a deficiency. And as a result, there are these very righteous individuals who make it a point in their life to serve God. And it gets, I don't want to skip ahead too much because this is the meaty stuff of the book, but that they do, they they have the ability through their actions to not only affect themselves, but because of the, their, their closeness to God that they can affect a lot more their generation. One of the best examples of that is the high priest. In the Kohen Gadol in scripture, he was, if he was righteous, he could do amazing things for Israel, for the, for the, for the nation of Israel as a whole. In fact, um, for the people who, um, who were in cities of refuge because they, they accidentally killed somebody, that when the Kohen Gadol died, he kind of, they were able to go out of the city. They were able to leave. And you gotta ask yourself, why? Well, you know, there's a really important concept there. And, um, when you look at like a lot of the prophets that are speaking, they're talking to these to these leaders because the these leaders or these people who are serving in this, in this function have a real profound effect on the on the whole um, status around them. And there's uh, the concept of of communal suffering that you see very clearly in scripture. You know, if Israel if you do this, you'll get this. But there's also the idea of communal reward, and those are really important um, concepts that the Ram Call will get into quickly. Um, Um, okay. Um, if you remember, I don't know if you are a believer in the um, New Testament or not, but I will I will ask the question anyway. Remember uh, a few minutes ago, I've asked the I've asked this question whether or not we need to love God just for who He is, or we need to or we love God because of the blessings that he gives us. And uh, just to uh, use an example, in uh, um, Hebrews, I believe it's uh, chapter 11, uh, he says, the Bible says that uh, um, whoever uh, diligently seeks God, uh, you'll find it and God will reward you. Because God is a rewarder. If I I didn't say the exact the same word, but this is the definition of it, I guess. So what does it? What I'm not understanding this. Um, if if God says if you look for me diligently, um, I'll show myself to you and I reward you. So uh, how can how can we love without having? Let's say if you love your husband, right? You want to see something good of him, to, to love him, right? If he's not good, how can you love him? If you're laying down and you're sick and he doesn't do anything for you, how can you love that person, right? So it, it, the same thing applies to God. How does this work again? I think it needs a little bit more explanation to understand what's the condition of uh, uh, loving God as uh, as a human being, you know. Uh, we know that God loves us for sure. Uh, it's a different, uh, I'm not talking from his behalf, I'm talking about our own behalf. How do we, how are we supposed to love him based on what he gives us or based on just him alone or based on both? Thank you. Well, the true reward of of striving after God, if you seek me, you will find me. It's that you find Him, that you find Hashem, that you you actually are blessed with a closer relationship to your Creator. It's um, I know there's some religions that say you know if you seek God and you give your tithe, you're going to get that big house, the Maserati, this six-figure salary, all those things that you really need and want in life. And that's again focusing on the external, because in the time of if you look in in I know in this world that we live in now to think that that witchcraft and that whole sorcery thing is a valid path to getting what you want. Well, you look in scripture, it pretty much was. And 
So if that's what they're, they're a way to obtain things, they're a way to obtain blessings. But the reward of seeking after God, if you look truly, truly is, is, is just this greater intimacy, this greater knowledge of the true essence of God. And, um, it, yeah, but in any relationship, there's also the give and the take, you know. <clears throat> um, if you, you know, if, if you love your husband because he's really handsome, well, you're going to feel when he's 70 and you're 70, God. Well, you know, and what are you going to think? Um, it, you know, if that's what, then, then you're setting yourself up for, you know, if you want a handsome guy and you're, you know, and that's why you love your husband, well, I mean, seriously, it's like somebody saying, you know, um, I have a book that I, you know, there's this book out there. Well, what is it? Oh, uh, it's, oh, you know, let's say it's Trek Shem. Have you read it? No, no, but it's the most amazing book ever. It's like, you people call him crazy. Well, why? Well, oh, I love the cover and the, the, the writing is so beautiful. It's like, well, what, what, what about the book do you love? And I, <laughs> bless your mind. So, it, it, that's the kind of analogy. It's like, you know, why do you love God? Well, God, you know, when I serve him, I feel so, I, I, you know, I can do this for God and I can do that for God and, you know, and I gave a tithe and like two weeks later, you know, I got $200 back when I really needed it. It's like, you know, if, if you need a loan, ask your neighbor. It's not, it, it, it is about that at one level. It really is. But the true, the true reward, the true relationship comes to, you know, experiencing that I, God is love, full of his loving kindness. He's slow to anger. He's merciful. He desires kindness, that he acts out of love. He desires only good. Those are the things that are the essence of God. And so in Israel, when they started to, to focus on the stuff, then, then, then the commandments became a burden, and they turned to other methods of getting the things that they wanted. They, they violated Shabbat to, to go out and, and sell things early because they wanted the money. They needed the things. They, they were looking at the external aspects of God, and and so a lot of those aspects of the way that they were, were that they were relating to God before became a horrible burden. They weren't done. They were done because they, they needed the stuff. So I don't know if that makes any sense to you. If that helped you at all, Is, Isabel, I you have no idea, absolutely no idea how how God has turned the page for me. Thank you. I never saw it this way, never, never, nobody explained to me, and I have met so many people that they thought they know God, but nobody has explained this to me, the fact that God, tonight God has opened my eyes, for so many years I've asked questions, for so many years I've asked questions. And finally, he's he's opening my eyes to see what it means to love God, and that's all I can tell you. And I, I, I was out, but I rushed to get here to listen. I had this question for many years. You have no idea. You have no idea. But thank you. Thank you very much. This meant more than life to me. More than life, you don't understand. When one really knows how, what it means to love God, it changes the whole thing. I couldn't understand all these years. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll just kind of trump it. I mean, seriously, people, what all is what all of is experiencing. Um, I um I experienced it when I read this book. It it um and I know a lot of people don't, you know, a lot of people think, well, this isn't the Bible, it's just a book. It it is a paradigm shift. It causes you to see things in a deeply personal way, scriptural things in a deeply personal way that that before you probably had never really seen it in, in, in that with that particular perspective, it it brings it down to a level that is heartfelt, to a level that is very personal, 
and causes a person to begin to read Scripture with a much more, I guess, I don't even know how to say it, in, in a much more personal, deep way. It causes you to see Scripture as something written to you. You see the Scripture as something for you, for the world, but also for you. And it causes you to recognize just how close the living God really is. Uh, I mean, seriously, um, I, I don't. I just wanted to say that. But you really, people, this book is is a it's a life changer, and uh, I, I just highly recommend. If you haven't gotten the book, get the book. Continue listening each week when Isabel presents uh, the sections that she presents. And uh, you will find yourself a different person. You'll find yourself with a relationship to God that is closer and deeper than you ever really conceived possible. Uh, I, I don't know what else to say. Uh, I'll, I'll have you just only touched the surface. It, it is a, it's, there's a lot more. If this has affected you positively, then hold on because... It only gets better. Uh, Mike is free. Um, one of the things that I need to say is I the first time the first time I read the Direct Hashem, I it was because I had a lot of these I guess concept questions that I needed answered, and so I really focused on a lot of the technical things that the Ram call um, brought about. And I'm sorry to say that at that point I had missed the entire purpose of his book and his work. And as a result, I've been blessed to be able to go back through the book and read it. And and it's like I did, I perceived it at one level at one time. But the but the true intent of the book is just so amazing. It's um, it is life changing. It's I don't I don't have like I don't have the words to discuss the the impact that I've experienced and just the way that I relate to myself, and my family, the world around me, um, to um. It's really caused a great paradigm shift as, a, as an understatement. So, um, no, it's been a, it's been a profound blessing, absolutely in every way. I can't and I can't state that enough to have the option, the ability to share some of this because I just you know this is a book I just want to go and like you know like shout about all the time. And it's um, it's been an amazing amazing blessing, and I cannot thank any anyone enough for for joining. Um, in this discussion. So. Yes, I have. Um, I have um, right the uh, link to get the book, but uh, the, the only problem is this. Um, I don't know, maybe because English is not my my mother tongue. Um, sometimes when someone explains to me. I understand it more than I read it, uh, especially when the book is complicated. So, but I, I guess um, uh, I'm I'm just afraid to get the book and I read it and I'm not getting it, not understanding unless uh, I, when I when I'm listening, like for instance to Isabel. Anyway, it's uh, um, I'm literally overwhelmed, but in a positive way. I, I don't think I can say tonight. I'm gonna have to think. I have I have oh okay. I have click. Uh, I have the link. I have click on the the link. Um, well I have. Um, is it is it possible I ask another question or it's it's not. Is it finished? Okay. Um. Um. Is uh, you see God has created us. That's evidence. Um, the question I have is: Did God give us enough means and understanding? Is it our rights, in other words, uh, to understand who God is? And does He did He give us the means to understand who He is enough in, in the Bible? You see what I mean? 
two question is one do we have right to understand um, enough as much as we need uh, and second did he give us enough information about himself to know who he is thank you uh, to the first part to do we have the right it's it's the it's the expectation of your existence that you will seek out the answer for why you're here and um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the movie The Matrix in that trilogy of movies but the um, person at the beginning of the book the, the movie is named Neo and he knows that something isn't right with the world but he can't quite put his finger on it so he goes on a search and he ultimately finds an answer to his question and he does so through subtle hints within within his world that lead him once he starts looking then the clues start to come all around him his eyes are opened things that he that he took for granted now become troublesome and worrisome for him because his eyes have been opened to there's something not right with the world and all that information that he needs suddenly falls into his lap at just the right time and there is and the Ram call gets into this period of, of us seeking out God and God um, answering our call and so we have the reveal we have a lot of revelation from Hashem um, through the scriptures to the Tanakh but there's also um, that spiritual re revelation that people receive and it's a the concept is prophecy and um, it's not this, you know, God speaking to you so you can say, you know, stand up and say, thus saith the Lord, you know, and you can speak about the future or you can have some amazing insights. It's about it's about this absolute pervasive sense of God filling every aspect of you as a person. It's this absolute ultimate pinnacle of closeness and relationship to God. And um, so there are ways that God reveals himself, not only through the, the through what we have through revealed scripture, but also through these moments where you really, really, really have this absolute pervasive sense of God in your in, in existence and in your in your oneness and all these things. And and um, so there are ways of 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 revelation that transcend even scripture. Now the dangerous part of that is that um, those types of experiences, those types of um, encounters can um, have to be within a specific context because when you start to experience spiritual things and start to become connected to the spiritual realm, if it's done improperly, it can be very dangerous. So I'm just saying that as a warning. I'm not saying anything specific about you. But that, yeah, there's a, there is an absolute almost expectation when, when you come into the world, into existence, that you're going to search out the reason that you're here. And um, it's not an easy quest. And it comes it comes with a lot of diligence. Uh, you know, in the, the quote in the New Testament, it's like, seek and knock again and again and again and again. And if you really, 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 it's that absolute pursuing of God, that absolute pursuit, in spite of all the obstacles, in spite of all the disappointments, in spite of all the seeming blind, blind alleys that you've gone down, that that you keep that pursuit going. It's that absolute unabashed wanting to know the truth that is rewarded and rewarded greatly in a small part in this world, but in an even greater extent in the world to come. Because there is a heavenly, there is a spiritual realm, there is a time of, of striving in this world that is absolutely reward it with this amazing absolute incredible connection to God in the world to come and the ability to connect to God in the world to come absolutely depends on what you've done in this world but that's skipping ahead so 